The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, BlackRock Investment Management Australia Limited, ABN 13006 165975, AFSL 230523, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, my name is Chris Carlin. I'm the founder of Mastery Money Now, which was recently acquired by Vista Financial Group. And I'm so excited to be hosting this podcast series about the clients of tomorrow. In these three episodes, brought to you by BlackRock, we'll be discussing ways you can engage with the clients of tomorrow, both from a marketing perspective and also from a process perspective. And we're going to be talking to two fantastic advisors who are already tapping into the advisors of tomorrow. Let's get started. BlackRock's purpose is to help more and more people experience financial well-being. As a fiduciary to investors and a leading provider of financial technology, we help millions of people build savings that serve them throughout their lives by making investing easier and more affordable. For additional information on BlackRock, please visit blackrock.com.au. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever, wherever you're listening to this. It is Chris Carlin here from Insomnol, and I'm very excited to welcome Karen Batsalas from Your Life and Money Matters. Karen has been in the industry for a very long time and uh, very excited to talk about her journey and uh, how she attracts clients, uh, how working as a uh, as a mum and how she balances mum life and business life and also what the clients of tomorrow look like. So without any further ado, Karen, welcome to Insomnial Podcast. Thanks, Chris. It's a really exciting to be on the podcast. I've listened to quite a few, so thanks for having me. Yeah, it's uh, I'm, and I'm 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 looking forward to this as well because we've crossed paths a couple of times uh, over the years, but I uh, never really have sat down and uh, listened to your journey, how you've got to where you are, and uh, yes, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to that. So, for those who have never heard of you, um, who is Karen Batsalis? So most people, <laughs> I'm. Um, I am a financial advisor. I've been in the industry for over 20 years, so I thought I would never want to be a financial advisor. I really liked financial services, but not this part of it. Um, and yeah, so I once I um, kind of crossed to the dark side, I really loved it. So I've worked for a few different firms, products, all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, now I'm here in my own business advising clients. Yep, fantastic stuff. And uh, outside of work, what do you do? Um, so I've got three children, um, so it's a lot of running around with the kids and and having family time. And um, I also recently restarted playing basketball on netball just to oh, nice. have a bit of a run around, which is a totally different game when you're yep. um, boarding, but uh, it's good fun. <laughs> How are your knees going? Knees are all right. I just come home with the biggest bruise. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Continue. I had a friend of mine who uh, was playing basketball and just did his ACL and uh, cut it on tape. He jumps, but the his, his mind said jump, but the legs weren't cooperating and uh, it looked painful. It was painful. So uh, uh, that's what you need income protection for, don't you? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. All covered. It's okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, okay, excellent stuff. So your life and money matters. So that's your practice. When did you start it? What was your driving ambition and what's your, uh, I guess, your unique service proposition? Um, so I've been in business almost six years now um, and I wasn't really sure. I never had this like burning desire to start my own business. It kind of sat in the background. Every now and then it'd come up and I'm like, no, no, I just want to find a home with other advisors. And um, But when I was pregnant with my second child, mm-hmm. I just felt like there was a better way to work um, and also – a way where I could work with the clients that I wanted to work in a way in a way that I wanted to work rather than the more traditional kind of model of financial advice mm-hmm. or what I was doing at the time. So I actually went to the company I was working for and I said, I want to do my own thing. And they were super supportive and kind of helped me do that. Um, whilst I was still exiting the business with them, I started my business. 
Yep. Um, and it was kind of a mat lead project. Okay. So a great time to start a business with a new <laughs> yes. one. Um, and, I, you know, I built it up slowly uh, and I really wanted to work with clients that were, when I first started, it was 20s, 30s, 40s, mm-hmm. um, with women being a focus, not only dealing with women, but I wanted them to kind of drive the interaction with me if they were part of a couple, uh, but also just attract women generally. So if anyone see my branding or anything like that, it, it's quite pretty because I like looking at the colors in my business and it makes me happy and it, it does kind of um, attract the kind of clients that I want to work with. Yeah, fantastic. And so you started from scratch then six years ago? Yes. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, had no clients and <laughs> At all, the great way to greatest way to start. But uh, having my second myself, and uh, I don't know how you started a business uh, with when you're with your second child on uh, on the scene. When my second child was born, I was like, "Nah, time to get out of here." So, how did you balance that? Um, I'm not sure balance is the right way, <laughs> but. You know, I, I did not have any clients. That means I didn't have any calls on my time straight away, like unless, yep. you know, so it wasn't like I didn't take on more than I could do at the time. Um, I had a few people come on pretty quickly, people that already knew me. So I wasn't doing heaps of marketing work to get clients. I was just working with people I already knew in that kind of space and working at odd times. That really worked for me in the early days. I'd be happy to work at night when the kids were in bed or, you know, dad was home to be with them and I could, um, you know, do online, all online. So I should say all of my appointments were pretty much online from day one. Yep. Um, so that helped. I could just jump on at 7.30 at night and have a meeting or a chat with someone or, you know, people would come to me and if there were people I knew, I would take my baby with me to meetings, whether it be BDMs or new clients. So yep. um, he came along. So it was that kind of family thing when I first started that um, really enabled me to do it, but also work with people that I was comfortable with. So I've had a meeting in a cubby house with my kids, oh. with that other friends. So they were like, yeah, I really want to do it. And they're like, well, we've got our kids home. Is that okay? I was like, all right, well, I'm going to bring mine. And so we were sitting in a cubby house while our kids play talking finances. And um, so, you know, I don't do that kind of stuff so much anymore, but in the early days with the clients that first came on board, that worked really well. That is uh, th- that is amazing. I, I've never had a client appointment in a cubby house. I've got to ask, like you said, our new clients, um, uh, did you sign those clients up? Yeah, yeah, they're clients. They're clients <laughs> yeah. That's the secret. That's the secret. It's yeah. not better presentations or sales pitches. It's just meet you. If they've got kids, meet them in a cubby house and away you go. Yeah. So, But I, the only time I've brought one of my children into an appointment. It was an online one. It was Chelsea. My youngest Chelsea was supposed to be asleep. And of course, um, 20 minutes in, she uh, woke up. She was only like four, six months at the time and absolutely cracked it. So my, uh, thankfully I had my, uh, uh, my associate with me and uh, she had to overtake that meeting and, um, and um, uh, it all went well. and was in sitting quiet with children. So they understood as well, but uh, it's, um, it's hard. It really is hard, isn't it? Just to um, manage uh, manage all those, um, uh, both being a parent and um, and also running a uh, meeting with clients. Like, do you think um, being a parent has helped you engage with uh, some of those younger clients? Yeah, I think um, definitely. And so when I first started, it was really 20s, 30s, 40s. And now I can say most of my clients are mid-30s, early 40s. And it's because we have a lot in common. We're on the same level in terms of what's going on in our lives. And I think people go, okay, well, you know what it's like if they can't come to a meeting or they've, they've got a kid in tow or whatever it will be, they they know that I'm going to understand. So I think it does really attract clients to that kind of proposition. And obviously being very, I'm just very out there in my marketing. I am who I am. I've got my family. If some people don't like that, that's cool. We're not a good fit, but I'm mm. attracting those people that are comfortable with that. And so it does work really well. Yeah, fantastic. And you mentioned your proposition, like how, what is your proposition? And uh, and I guess aligned to that, how would you say it differs from uh, a traditional advice model? Um, so it's very service-based. So um, all of my clients now generally, they agree to a set of services for a fee and usually for a 12-month period. And that is just set in stone from day one when we actually start, you know, actively working together. And we cover whatever needs to be covered in their world. But generally, it's you know, it's the same kind of things. It's how they're managing their money day to day, insurance, super investment, 
um, you know, managing debt and the strategies around that and what the focus is will be depending on what the client goals are and, and we kind of go where we need to. Whereas like traditionally when I was working, I mean, and I've had clients come to me saying, I went to a financial advisor and they told me you've got no assets, come back when you've got some assets. And I'm blown away by this because I kind of live in an environment now where the advisors I speak to do similar things to what I do. Mm. And so I was horrified, but it's happened several times. And I suppose that's where I kind of think of a traditional company that will do some insurance and super, certainly where I was um, prior to opening my business, that was kind of the focus. Or if you've got some money, we'll invest it for you and but we want you to have quite a bit of money because otherwise we can't charge a fee on a thing. Whereas I'm like, well, this is the fee and if you want my help, I'm, I'd love to help you, but I need to be paid for it. And if they're not comfortable with that, we don't we don't go ahead. I'm a lot stricter about that these days, being in the early yes. like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll just discount it because I really want to help you. And that, that actually doesn't work from a business perspective. No, it doesn't. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's kind of the main difference is that we're kind of, it's really service-based and, you know, helping kind of coach them through their decision-making as opposed to what have you got to invest and what are we going to do with your money? We do that if I need to. Yeah, yeah. No, that's um, – yeah, I, I still get that as well. The people come to me say I went to another financial plan and said that I didn't have enough to uh, work with them. And I get there's, uh, you know, probably more wealth managers I would class them than uh, than uh, financial advisors per se. But, uh, yeah, it is, uh, it is quite interesting that there is still – no, it's interesting is not the right word, but uh, I guess uh, there's so many niches, so many – Financial planner covers so many different areas, and um, yeah, what's not a good fit for uh, someone um, is going to be f- good fit for uh, for someone else, and, uh, and yeah. that's where that collaboration in the financial planning industry, I just think, is uh, absolutely phenomenal. Do you get many referrals from other financial planners? I get a couple, not a heap. Um, I think, but I think that is my ideal. Like, I feel like financial planners could be the best referrers for each other. Mm. So, in that situation, I would love if they had a seat. We don't do that, but the clients really walked away thinking that they weren't good enough to get financial advice. Yes. So I'd love them messaging to be different if that's not what they do in that kind of case so that they then go, oh, maybe there is someone who can help me instead of waiting five, ten years to looking at it again. But, yeah, I have had a few referrals and I like to give referrals. I don't do aged care. I rarely take on, you know, pre-retiree clients. Mm -hmm. So I like to give those referrals to people who are in that all the time. But it is a space I'd like to do more work in, but one of the things of – being part time and yes. <laughs> uh, trying to do all the things is I have to be very focused on which you know, where I focus my marketing time and energy because I can't do all the things that are in my head that I would like to do. Yep, yeah, but it's uh, you can't spread yourself too thin. And as one of my uh, first mentors said, uh, you can't uh, you can't boil the ocean. So you've got to be so super niche uh, in what you do, and um, and that means yeah turned in a way clients who may want your help but you just know you're not a good fit so um no, so yeah we'll, i'll come back to your um to how you attract clients and that uh part-time uh stuff in a moment but before i move on because we were talking beforehand we're talking we're talking about proposition and i know um something you said prior to our uh uh to this uh recording is the fact that you had a cash flow service but you originally got rid of it and that's I find that fascinating because I never have made cash flow advice work, uh, and I've looked after a traditionally millennial client base as well. But it is something that a lot of people uh, have been constantly pushing um, on advisors. If you want to gauge a millennial client, you've got to give cash flow advice. And I know one or two that do it and do it well, but I'd say the majority don't. So what... um, what did you do and why did you decide to uh, remove that cash flow service? Uh, I used to do a cash flow, I called it a checkup, and it was to engage clients. It was kind of a low cost fee, come in, I'm going to look at how you're spending, identify areas, do a bit of a strategy paper of where we could do some work. But I would go, I'd use Moneysoft, went through all of their finances. And I think it was really valuable for the client, but it, is expensive when it was just me to spend my time on that. Um, mm. And so it wasn't really something that I could scale in a way um, that I wanted to. And also I found the clients that I was attracting for that kind of service, I couldn't justify personally and I don't think they could really justify the fees for the other services, even though they could have you know, done well yep. on them. They probably weren't in the right salary bracket yep. to – then go on and do some of the other work. Like I would definitely get them on the right track and they would start saving. But 
I just wasn't a good fit as kind of my ideal clients after that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that took me probably two or so years to kind of work through and try different things and try different fee structures. I think it is really important like service, but it's hard to do that along with financial advice and strategy work yep. um, unless you want to have two separate offers. Um, if I could have someone trained up, they could do it really well, um, you know, do the actual getting in there and doing the work in MoneySoft or whatever program mm. you use. I yep. think that would be really good, but I just didn't have the time. And I tried a few, um, like had trialed a few staff members doing some of that work, but I still found that I needed to get my head right in there to know how they were spending to talk to them about it. Yes. Um, so it's just too much time mm-hmm. and I didn't feel justified charging the fee that I'd need to charge for that time. I could be doing other work that I could charge more for essentially. So as a business, it didn't make sense. As a service, I'd love to offer it to people because I think so many people need it. Yeah, it's one of those things that uh, yeah, those that need it can't afford it. And can I ask what sort of fees were you charging as a starting point for that service? Um, for an initial kind of review, um, we should go back about three months saying this is how you've spent yep. and this is what we think to change. I was charging $550 and it mm. was, I kind of thought that's fine. It's a bit of a loss leader, but it wasn't really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They took the service to go any further. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then there was some that I did have ongoing tracking for, and I was charging about $185 a month, yep. um, which once it got going was kind of kind of worked but also I just don't think that you can I could for those kind of clients that wanting that service I was like well at this point go put that 185 it's kind of working for you now you can benefit but I just felt like they could use the money doing other things at that sure. point okay so you sound like you were the you were probably saying more to cease the service rather than they were saying this is too expensive we're not getting a benefit anymore yeah like there's a yep. bit of both but, yeah, it was kind of, I don't know, just being able to justify the fee. Even though I, I knew it was adding value, I just I, I just found it difficult to keep justifying it for them. Yeah. Yeah, especially when it's funny from cash flow and uh, you probably struggle to call that a tax deductible because there was no advice document prepared. Am I right? Yes. So often yep. there was no advice document. There's no investments to speak of at that point. Yep. Yeah, it became tricky to, you know, structure it in a way that was really efficient for them as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's a shame, but uh, yeah, it's I, uh, you've hit the nail on the head. Apart from those high net wealth clients earning two hundred k plus, it is a really challenging service to uh, get up on the ground and help those who probably need it more than anyone else. Yeah, and I yep. find my clients that are in that kind of uh, income bracket two hundred plus, they're like. It, it's not that effective for them because they're like, mm. well, I earn this much money. I'm going to spend it how I spend it. So I actually track them in a different way that doesn't take hours because they don't want me to say, well, you've spent, this is where you've spent the money in all these areas. We just need to make sure that they're, you know, ahead on their offset account or their investment goals or whatever it is, as long as that's happening and they're keeping their core spend roughly what it needs to be at work. So yep. they don't want that scrutiny as well, I found at that level. Yeah, no, I totally, that's, that's really. Uh, that's really smart, and you're absolutely right because they they don't want you to hold your hand or babysit them at that level. They and, and you would know as an advisor when you do their six or twelve month review whether they're ahead of where they were twelve months ago or behind. Like you look at their offset or investments, and if it's at fifty grand, it's now sixty grand. Well, clearly they're ahead. So uh, uh, yeah. it's often that's all the tracking that you need to do. Yeah, I still track them like that kind of stuff on a monthly. I just don't. Okay. Um, I don't need that kind of tool and that kind of yeah depth into their situation. Yeah, and it's it's sometimes simple works, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yes. It just sometimes takes a long time to realise that simple works. Yes, yes. Um, uh, but yeah, people sometimes we look at all these services that we provide, and um, and sometimes they're just not exactly what the client wants. They just want something a little bit more simple and cost effective and just shows that they, they're they getting a bit closer from where they are now to where they want to be. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's move on to um, how you go about obtaining clients. And uh, I know you're big on social media. So what's your... Um, What's your strategy? In, and you've mentioned marketing before. Um, what's your uh, What's your overall marketing and uh, attracting client strategy? Uh, so my main focus is social media, um, Instagram. So um, I try to post there three times a week, and 
always getting better. Um, at, you know, what I'm posting, I've done some work with Adele Martin around like improving my um, Instagram marketing and that sort of work. Um, also Facebook, so not so much Facebook posting. I don't really like Facebook, but I've been – uh, local groups where I've lived or I live, I'm um, kind of getting involved. When people ask questions, I will respond, try and respond to a question, not saying, hey, talk to me, but just try and provide some general information if I can or point them somewhere. And, and I find that through that, doing that over many years, being on podcasts that still kind of get flicked around some of those groups that I get referrals or at least people then coming to find me on Instagram and coming through that way. So yep. Um, that's been a long game, but it has tended to work over time where I'll get people and they're like, oh, I had this podcast you five years ago or someone mentioned to speak to you. And I'm like, oh, that's so old, but that still works even though I haven't done some of that work for a while. Yeah, it's you're right. The long game is key, and uh, whether it's social media or SEO or posting groups or podcasts, whatever it might be, a lot of these don't have an immediate return. It's it can be one, two, three, five years down the track where you, those clients are starting to come in. Yeah, and and that definitely has been the case. And people who haven't become clients but have listened to me or spoken to me, and then like, no, we don't want to become a client. They'll like refer someone three years yeah. later as well. So just keeping that kind of keeping the content fresh and um around what clients and people I know are kind of the decisions they're making uh, really works in bringing clients on. Are you good at doing that graphic design work or do you outsource that? Uh, I wouldn't say I'm good at it, but I don't outsource it. I use Canva. Uh, yes. And, and um, sometimes I spend ages, other times you you'll just, I'll just like, I'm like, better just put it out there than, you know, not do anything. My videos are like half the time handheld, um, you know, wobbling and like, all right, it's out there. That's fine. I've done it. <laughs> Yes. Yep. So it doesn't have to be perfect. It does not have to be perfect, but it does have to be a certain quality. And I know I couldn't meet that certain quality, so I've outsourced mine. But uh, I'm very glad that, uh, uh, yeah, if you've got if you if you've got the skills to do it, and I definitely recommend checking out um, uh, Karen's uh, Instagram page because it is uh, uh, very good from both a content perspective and a graphic perspective. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, it definitely can be beneficial, but it is a long-term game, as you just said. It's, uh, it certainly doesn't happen overnight. Did you ever do any paid advertising online? No, I've never done any paid advertising. It's all been um, yeah, just organic, kind of slowly yep. putting things out there. Yep. Yeah. I did it for a bit. I had limited success. So uh, I don't know a few others that in particular niches do it really well. So, um, uh yeah, at the end of the day, you've got a business that's uh, chugging along nicely. So um, uh, if you don't need to do paid advertising, why put the money into it? Yeah, I mean, actually, I should say, I have tried, you know, when it comes out saying, do you want to boost this post? Ah, like, oh, yes. Let's see yeah. what happens. I have done that, actually. I just remembered, but yeah. no idea what I'm doing. I feel like that's a whole thing I need to work out how to do. And I'm just like, we'll just keep, keep doing what we're doing because it seems to be working. So yeah, throw five, 10 bucks on it, see yeah, what yeah, happens. Yeah. And yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah, I've been there, done that as well. So uh, <laughs> didn't quite work for me, though. I don't think it works for me. <laughs> Let's move on because um, I'm particularly interested in um, this, uh, the fact that you uh, own your own practice, but you're doing this uh, part-time. So a couple of quick fire questions for us. The main question, um, who are you licensed through? Um, I know the licensee is called Clarity Financial Services, just a oh, yeah. whole group of advisors. Um, I think we're capped at 10, which is good. So just all kind of advisor run. Yeah, fantastic. And your team, is it just you or who, who's who's in the background? Um, it's just me. I've done a little bit of attempts at outsourcing in the past. Um, and this year, I think I've got some good outsourcing partners on board that I'm just finalizing now. So, but yep. largely it's been me. Um, and hopefully this year is going to be that turning point where I get some good things in place. Yeah, fantastic. Those, um, so contractors with like power planning and admin work? Yes. Yep. Right. Yep. So, I mean, yeah, contracts is a certainly a great place to start, but you're definitely doing a lot of the uh, the the heavy lifting, I think it's fair to say. And I just think particularly because when you say part-time, you're three days a week, I believe. I'm three days, well, three school days ah, yes, now. Yes. And I was, I was actually doing one and a half last year. Yep. So, yeah, this is an um, increase for me this year. Yeah, I... I'm just I'm just boggled how you do it because even for, I'm thinking from a financial perspective and 
and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you'll ask to see something different that I'm not aware of, but part-time advisors don't get uh, part-time uh, licensee fees. They don't get part-time uh, professional indemnity insurance, and they don't get uh, part-time rent, although you might be in a co-working space or working from home. Um, how, how, how do you do it? Um, I think that has been the tricky thing. So in, in my first year when I was like on that leave, I didn't pay any um, fees. So in, that helped because yes. I didn't have any really costs to deal with. Yep. And now coming up to the sixth year, obviously, I've got all those costs. Mm. And, you know, there are times when it's break even and it's like, yep. why am I doing this? I'm taking all this risk to break even. Yep. Um, but it's, again, it's been a long-term game. So when I went in, I knew that doing it part-time is not going to be right away the most financially beneficial thing to do for my business, my family, yep. all of that. But we have the space to be able to do it so that long-term I could have a really solid business and keep my hand in the game while my children were at school sure. um, and so that as I have less responsibility with them, yeah. I can work at you know at whatever pace I want to so that has been a challenge but it's just about and that's what the past couple of years been really efficient with what clients I take on um, yeah. where I spend my time so that it is um, you know making sure that you do that work that is going to bring in revenue that we all like helping clients we want to really help them in their lives but we need to make money ourselves if we're going to do that. So just getting smarter and smarter about where I'm putting my energy and time um, to make sure that I can make those things work. My licensee has been pretty good. They're not a you know high cost. I know they're you know the fees can really vary from one to the other. So okay. I've gone for um, you know, but pretty simple. We don't even get a lot of help from them. They, you know, we've kind of got an arrangement that works for both of us. I try not to harass them too much. They have to leave me to it as long as we're all doing what we need to do. So that works. It's also frustrating because I, in, in my head, there's all these things that I want to be doing, but I just can't. So I have to yep. really keep clear on what I am going to do and stick yep. to that. And I also just got really efficient. You know, when I sit down to work, I've got a block to work and I have to be really efficient with what I'm doing with that time mm-hmm. to make sure the clients get what they need, but I'm also still doing you know, revenue producing activities, marketing. So I have to be really smart about that and have to keep checking that I'm doing the right thing. So I'm efficient with my time, but I then need to make sure I'm always playing and always blocking out time in the right ways and then reviewing like, is that still the most efficient way to spend my time? So I think that um, has helped. I'm not taking on more clients than I can handle. So this year, is really exciting because I'm going to be able to open up to more clients. Whereas last year it was like, okay, I'm open, you know, I'll do it slowly. And the year before I was essentially on that leave again with my third child. So I, you know, they only took on a handful of clients. So it's really about, you know, making it work, but also not trying to do more than I can. Whereas now I'm like, okay, now I'm seriously back doing it, taking on clients and and building again. Yeah. So you're, so the, when you're part-time, especially when you said last year that you're one or two days a week, you're you're viewing that as a I'm not going to grow the business now, but I can maintain the business on one or two days a week with the intention that as my kids get older, I'll be able to grow the business more, which ultimately would be your exit strategy. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, I don't know about exit strategy, but definitely yep. long term kind of goals around being able to work in a flexible way for as long as I can um, yep. and want to. But yeah, just be able to like so I. Definitely took on new clients last year, but it was more of a, a maintenance, a slow burn, not trying to shoot the lights out, not doing heaps of marketing. Um, whereas this year, I've got a bit more time to give to that. So, um, and that'll be kind of the standard now going forward, having three days plus in the business. Yeah, fantastic. And Ed, you've half asked this question, but uh, um, what if we are to fast forward five years, 2029, 2030, where would you like to take your business? Uh, I have, I'm in two minds about this. So you know, the original mind is, yes, we're just going to keep, I'm going to keep working on a service clients that I can always contact uh, and so that I can be the face of the business and just, you know, get to a point where I can just manage that quite easily in the time I want and then have a really flexible life. So that's like option one. So maybe, yep. um, but then sneaking into the back of my mind is like, okay, if I can achieve this, achieve a successful part-time business as a mom raising children, I kind of want to be able to help someone else to do the same. Yes. So the other vision is at some point bringing someone in um, that's, you know, based locally or in Australia to, you know, 
do you know help them do the same in this in my business or in some kind of way where you know where we can have more part-time financial advisors and we can make it work and whether it be men or women that want to work around families be that and not so yep. that's that's always in the back of my mind as well so yeah I'm not yep. sure yet <laughs> Yeah, no, nah, and uh, that ties into my next question, actually, um, because as we're recording, it's uh, March 2024. We've just had uh, International Women's Day, and we know that um, women represent about one in four, one in five uh, advisors, and there's, I know, there's a few reasons for that, but one of them is that uh, trying to juggle that um, uh, being an advisor and uh, being connected to family is certainly a challenge. What... What needs to be done to attract, and I'll probably suggest the bigger question is retain uh, female financial advisors in the industry. I can mainly only speak personally, but I feel like, and this could have been a limiting thing on my side, but it felt like I couldn't progress in my career if I stayed part-time. Yes. I couldn't earn more, do more, and let, if unless I was, while I was part-time as a, an employee. So I think- to normalize part-time as an option, if people want that, then, you know, let's normalize part-time and flexibility and yep. keep women giving advice in a way that works for their life. Yep. And eventually that's going to unfold to men as well. So then they get the opportunities around spending time with family. Like it should yes. be for everyone, but I'd love the folks for, the, for women to be able to do that now and that just to be a norm. Like every time I look, I see, you know, financial advisor roles pop up, it's like, well, we've got these full-time roles. So I've had people contact me, oh, do you want to come work for us full-time? I'm like, sell my business and work for you full-time. And, um, no, thanks. Like, yeah, like, yes, yep. You know, I might have looked twice if you said work part-time. Or, do you know what I mean? Yep. So I think just have that as an option that you don't need to have all the like these clients. And if we can normalize that, and I know there's, as you mentioned, fees involved with, you mm-hmm. know, but I, I think there are ways around that. I think we can be smart about that too. Yeah, if if those professional, particularly the professional indemnity and the licensee fees, which are outside of rent and obviously staff, are two of the biggest costs in the um, in the industry. If we can link them a bit more towards the days that you work, which is ultimately probably linked to revenue as well, um, that would be, um, I think, the ideal outcome. But I can already hear those who are on the higher income saying that, you know, we're paying a higher fee just to supplement those on a uh, on a lower income, and that's not fair. So I don't have an answer, but uh, but someone who's doing four days a week uh, now, um, uh, there's definitely benefits uh, to doing that. And um, uh, But you're right. It's certainly that perception that if you're part-time, you're just going sideways. You're not moving ahead, and you're proving that to be absolutely incorrect. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think you can do, I don't know, I think you can be really efficient part-time and my clients really know which days I work. They, I'm there for them if they need me. Um, yep. So, you know, it works from that side as well. Yeah, it's and that's the part of the communication, you value proposition. Like for me, I don't work Fridays so, uh, uh, anymore. So um, uh, if you communicate that clear with clients, then um, they can't complain if you're not picking up the phone on Fridays. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, excellent stuff. Uh, one final question. Uh, this is something I ask anyone who's um, I've got a lot of respect for what they've achieved, and uh, you definitely fall into that category. What if you could go back to your twenty-one-year-old self? Um, what would you say to them, and why? Don't get the credit card. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a money story there that we haven't shared. <laughs> Oh, I even I you know when one of those things where I'm like I know I should never have a credit card. I knew that early on, always a good saver, and I got the credit card, yep. did the fun things, and then um, had the debt. But I, I knew have it, I don't know. I've always been kind of good around money, so I paid it off pretty quickly. So oh, that's not a big one. I don't know. Probably actually go straight to uni and do financial planning rather than do it the long way. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yep. So what was the long way for you? So I started working. I did applied science at uni, and I started working. In um, like admin and then admin in financial services and then slowly did my diploma and uh, kind of came through that way, and which is fine because I, I learned a lot along the way and I'm still studying now. But I think it would have been good to get that initial kind of university grounding. I went to uni anyway, like may as well do something that you're actually going to work in and yeah. in the future and rather than something you're never going to work in. So I think that would have been um, something good to do back then. 
would have saved you a lot of time and uh, and a significant help debt, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yep. I've at least been a usable one, so yeah. Yes. <laughs> Are you all set for, for CS standards? You've got your degree and everything? Uh, I'm still doing subjects now, so I'm doing my master's. I think I've oh, got about to finish a subject now, and I think I've got one more that I need to technically do, which is annoying because I waited so many years. I'm like, I'm ready to study more, but I had to wait to see yep. what it was I had to study. I would have you know done it ages ago, but it was just you know that waiting period where we didn't know exactly what we were going to need to do. Yep. Um, and I didn't want to do something and then it not be counted. So, yeah, I think I've got one more subject after this one, um, and then we'll do some more anyway. Fantastic. So you run your own business, you've got a mum to three kids, you play basketball, and you're studying your master's on top of that as well. Yeah, only slowly, only like one uh, at a time, but yeah. <laughs> it's still a big commitment, so uh, hats off to you, Karen. And uh, and yet, despite all that, you've still managed to find time to speak to us. So uh, thank you again for your time. If people want to find uh, out more about you or connect with you, what's where should they go? Uh, probably the best place to use my Instagram, at Your Life and Money Matters. Um, that's the thing I look at the most and has the most recent kind of information on there. I, I'm definitely uh, uh, following that and uh, I would encourage anyone to follow as well. So, Karen, again, thank you so much for your time. It's been a privilege and uh, I'm sure we'll cross paths again in the future. Great. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.